Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 5, and here's what it says. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So let me stop there and refresh us a bit with what's happening here in the book of Hebrews. This is obviously a person that is writing to a Jewish believing audience. What do I mean by Jewish believing? Well, these are Jewish people, practicing Jews, people who believe in the covenants of God, who believe in the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the law. And in fact, it seems evident that the writer is writing this before 70 AD. In other words, people are still going to Jerusalem to offer animal sacrifices to the temple there before it was destroyed in 70 AD, because he talks about this in this passage. So notice this. This author is saying to a Jewish audience, hey, we know we have the law from Moses and all these sacrifices, the priests, the high priests, the temple, etc. But now that the Messiah has come, now that he has been crucified on the cross, been raised from the dead, now all of this that was happening for the old covenant has now been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ or Yeshua. And so he says here, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. And as we go through the chapters, you're going to find out that the writer of Hebrews says, hey, this high priest talking about Jesus, who is now our high priest. We don't have a Levitical high priest anymore. This is our high priest in the body of Christ. And so it says, and he'll say throughout the chapters, and particularly when we get to chapter 9, this high priest needs to offer both gifts and sacrifices as well. Now, he's offered himself once and for all for sin. But there are other gifts. There are other sacrifices, like it'll say in a later chapter, the sacrifice of praise. And so we'll talk about this in a little while. But this is what he's talking about. He's comparing the high priest in the Levitical priesthood to our new high priest, in the new covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, For every high priest taken from among, uh, among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, talking about Levitical priests, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. Verse 5, so also is Christ. He's comparing Jesus as high priest to the Levitical priest. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who who said to him, Father God, who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this is going to be re repeated, I believe, at least five more times. Uh, quoting this from the Psalms about Jesus, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So it goes on to say, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, 
and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So let's just stop there and make sure that we understand what he's saying. That starts in that run starts in verse 5. So also Christ, just like the Levitical priests, were taken from among men, and they can relate to what human beings need in terms of the need for sacrifice and so on, because they themselves are human beings and need that. Well, it says in a similar way, though Jesus didn't need to sacrifice for sin, it says, so also Christ did not glorify himself. In other words, he didn't appoint himself, just as Levitical priests don't appoint themselves. Jesus did not appoint himself or glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, Father God, who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever. So that tells us that back in the Psalms, when he's quoting this, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, that that psalm is a messianic psalm. It's a prophetic psalm, and it's a messianic psalm. In other words, Father God was saying that to Jesus post-resurrection, but it's captured in the Psalms, which is way back maybe a thousand years before Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem. This is how prophecy can work, that God's outside of time, so he speaks in these pockets of time, but they all can connect together in the time spectrum or continuum. So the father said, you were a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus when he was here in the flesh on earth, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Do you remember if this is if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And so the writer of Hebrews is sharing with us, oh, those prayers were vehement cries and prayers to Father God. Please, God, please, God, if there's any way. And it says, he was praying to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard. Notice that that prayer wasn't answered to save him from death, because had the Father spared him from dying, we would have still been lost. And so, it says, and he was heard because of his godly fear. So, Jesus had a godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So notice this, because he came in the flesh and because he had to walk out obedience to God in every point of the law, while being a human being in the flesh, he was learning that obedience through the things which he suffered. In other words, he was experiencing this way that human beings have to press through the weakness of the flesh, the, the desires of the flesh, the temptations and all that. Jesus came as a human being to be like us, though he was God. He became also a human being to experience what it was like to be human, what it was like to be obedient to God, despite all the pressures, the temptations of the flesh. So he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Verse 9, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And having been perfected. So after going through all of that and being declared that I find no fault in him, he's innocent, he's done nothing wrong multiple times, he was declared right there at the end uh, when he was about to be executed, that he was innocent and such. He was declared to be the spotless lamb, is what it was, prophetically. And it says he then, of course, was killed and then resurrected on the third day, and he's been perfected. And now he is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Notice to all who obey him, not just to all who say a prayer. Oh, there is an extreme view of grace that now that the grace of the Lord Jesus has come, we don't have to worry about being obedient and walking in righteousness or holiness. We, we can pretty much do whatever we want to. Don't worry about it because we're under grace now. <laughs> well, that's a wrong understanding of grace. Thank God grace is a complete replacement of having to work for salvation in any way. However, having received the grace of God, if you really did receive it, 
then you should walk in that grace because the grace is not only to be forgiven from sin, but to strengthen you to walk away from sin and to walk now in obedience. Verse 10, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There it is again. According to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So the writer of Hebrews says, Oh, we have a lot to explain to you that we could explain to you about Melchizedek. Now, you remember Melchizedek, the the priest that showed up in Genesis 14 with Abraham when he was coming back from the defeat of the kings to rescue Lot and his family, that Melchizedek came out, you remember, with bread and wine, and, and he blessed Abraham. And blessed be Abraham, Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and, and blessed be God Most High, and so on. And then Abram, or Abraham, gave a tithe, a tenth of all the spoils, to Melchizedek. And so it says, uh, the writer says, we have much to explain to you about Melchizedek. It's hard to explain, and here's why it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. So notice that even a profound, anointed, inspired teacher uh, is has a difficulty in explaining things when people are spiritually dull of hearing. And so you know, oh, I'm going to have to explain so much because they're just not in tune with the things of the Spirit. They're not sensitized to the things of the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be dull of hearing. In fact, Lord, help us to be keen hearers of the Word and not be dull Help our senses, our minds, our spirits to be sharp and to catch these things in Jesus' name. So the writer says we've got much to explain, and we're going to learn a lot about Melchizedek in the the forthcoming chapters. Verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. So notice, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. He's writing to a, you know, a whole group of people, and he's saying, by this time you ought to be teachers. In other words, all of you should be able to teach these things. And yet, he goes on to say, uh, you need someone to teach you again the first principles, like the elementary things, the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So he's clearly saying, with the teaching of God's Word, there are different levels of teaching. And he's not talking about children versus adults, except spiritually he may be talking about children versus adults. And so he's saying there are different levels, and when you get to a certain level, you begin to be able to eat what we call the meat of the Word. I mean, just like the steak of God's Word. But when you're not at that level, you need the milk. You need just little bites of it, truths that are more broad stroke and such, but you can't really understand the intricacies of the mysteries of God. That's when it gets really fun, by the way, when you realize, oh my goodness, this is layer upon layer of the wisdom of God built like like going from a puzzle when you're a preschooler and it's got whatever, like eight pieces, and now you've got, you know, tens of thousands of pieces But, oh, when they go together, it paints this most beautiful, amazing, three-dimensional, I guess you should say, maybe four-dimensional spirit realm puzzle. And, oh, you look at it, and the glory of God comes out of this, and you realize how magnificently wise God is that he put this whole thing together for us, for our salvation. So it says here, you've uh, come to need milk and not solid food. Notice, come to need. In other words, you used to be sharper spiritually than you are. Oh, that speaks to a lot of people. You used to be more hungry. You used to be more in tune. You used to catch things more quickly than you do now. You you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Notice again, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. So there are a lot of believers today that they will receive the word, but just with the maybe the big concepts. But when they go to speak, they're not precise. They're unskilled. 
So this is why you can't just put anybody that's passionate or uh, they got a great personality and they understand the basics of the Bible. You can't put them up as a teacher. And the reason is because they're unskilled. They will misspeak because they don't have the heart to, uh, to ingest the details, the line upon line details, so that even when you're talking about the broader concepts, the more general concepts of salvation through Jesus and of the Holy Spirit and of the Trinity and of the Bible, you don't even realize you're misspeaking because you're using words that are not precise and accurate. And you're not describing, you're not conveying the truth as you ought to convey it. Well, that's because you are still uh, drinking milk from the word, but not really getting down into the study. It takes work to do that. You remember uh, the scripture in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent, the New King James says, the King James, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth, knowing how the different concepts fit together as a beautiful puzzle. That takes effort. That takes diligence to do. Somebody that's still on the milk and not on the meat, they don't have that diligence, that hunger that's required to want to know, the quest to want to know those details. And so for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use, or one translation says practice, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Excuse me, I want to close with this one verse here. Uh, but solid food belongs to those who are full age. Solid food, like the meat of the word, we would say, belongs to those who are full age. That is those who by reason of use, by reason of use. In other words, we're not just talking about people that are learners just to learn knowledge. But no, you learn more when you're putting it into practice. Think about this. Somebody that wants to learn uh, to be a, an auto mechanic. Well, you can just get a book, you know, auto mechanics, you know, 101, and you read the whole book. And maybe there's a particular car, a particular engine you read the book on, but you've never worked on an engine in your life, never even changed the oil in a car. Well, but then you have another person that, yes, they're looking at the book and referring to the book, but they're also looking back at the engine and pulling it apart and looking, and they're reading the book, but they're doing it. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. Let me put it another way. This is what God is telling us today. God is saying, those people who don't just learn knowledge, but they're actually living this life out, they're putting it into practice by reason of use, they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When you're putting the word into practice in your life, you're doing it. You're learning about prayer and authority over the devil, but now you're doing it. You're praying. You're taking authority over the devil. You're watching how God's word and the, the authority in Jesus' name plays out. Now you're, you're in tune because you're into this now and you're learning to discern good and evil. You're learning to discern the temptations, the deceptions. See, like when the disciples were trying to cast that demon out and they couldn't cast it out and then Jesus comes and casts it out and they say, why couldn't we do it? And he says, because of your unbelief. And then he says, however, this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. He's teaching them when you get into this and you begin to practice it, you learn the ins and outs of it. And now you know it. Now you know it, not just uh, with learning head knowledge, but you know it experientially. You know how to work, how to work it out, how to put the word into practice. See, and now when you explain it, you explain it at a whole new level of depth and understanding than someone who just learned it sort of out of a book in their heads, but they don't really know how to walk it out. Oh, somebody that knows how to walk this out. Let me tell you, they, they can explain it very differently and much better. So this says they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So notice, you don't just know in your head what's good and evil, but you begin to have your senses exercised, your whole being. Let me say it a different way. 
your soul, your mind is being renewed to the word of God so that you're discerning as a whole person right and wrong in the ins and outs of things because you're walking it out and doing it. This is a mature person. Uh, James 1.20, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Well, that's it for today. That's chapter five, and I look forward to chapter six tomorrow.